Welcome to our first iteration of the Bible of the First Christian series. I'm Dr. Jonathan Numata, and uh, I will be helping to facilitate uh, tonight's program. Uh, tonight's event is jointly sponsored by Northwest Seminary and College, as well as the John William Weavers Institute for Septuagint Studies. Northwest Seminary and College is a member school of the Associated Canadian Theological Schools of Trinity Western University. The Weavers Institute is a joint scholarly endeavor between Axe and Trinity Western University. It is one of the few research institutes in the world devoted to the study of the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that is best known to us today as the source of the Old Testament quotations we find in the New Testament. Four Northwest faculty and staff are research fellows at this institution, uh, Drs. Larry Perkins, Dr. Don Chang, myself, and Dr. Joel Karitko. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Larry J. Perkins, Emeritus Professor of Biblical Studies and President Emeritus at Northwest Seminary and College. Larry has two bachelor's degrees and three master's degrees from Oxford University and the University of British Columbia, in addition to his PhD in Septuagint Studies from the University of Toronto. Larry was a founding member of the Weavers Institute when it was first launched in 2003 and has published 41 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, 17 book reviews, and has edited or authored four books. Larry's presentation is entitled Intertextual Perspectives, How Reading the Septuagint Helps Us to Read the New Testament. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Larry Perkins. Thank you, Dr. Nemata, for your kind words. And it's a joy tonight to inaugurate uh, this new series uh, that is being sponsored by Northwest Baptist Theological College and Seminary, as well as the John William Weavers Septuagint Studies Institute. So it is uh, a great pleasure to be able to share some of the ideas and some thoughts on this particular subject and I've entitled the presentation tonight, uh, Bring the Scrolls, but especially the Notebooks, quotation out of 2 Timothy 4, verse 13, and subtitled then, Intertextual Perspectives, How Reading the Septuagint Helps Us to Read the New Testament. Now, I should say, as we begin, that some of you might be new to Septuagint studies, and so I've tried to uh, calibrate the presentation so that it is not overly technical, uh, but on the other hand, I also realize that some of you participating are, as it were, uh, veterans in terms of Septuagint studies. So I hope there will be enough here for both levels to understand and to, uh, in some way, uh, find valuable. So we begin by thinking a little bit about this text in 2 Timothy 4 verse 13. Uh, shortly before his death, Paul writes to his protege Timothy, probably around 63, 64 CE, and instructs him to bring the scrolls, especially the notebooks, when he comes to visit him, presumably in Rome. The word translated scrolls, ta biblia, probably refers to biblical scrolls. However, we are not so sure what the notebooks, tas membranas, literally, the prepared skin sewn together to form a notebook might include. Perhaps these were notes Paul had composed for personal use or copies of his letters, or maybe lecture notes prepared when he taught for over a year in the city of Ephesus. And of course, Timothy, according to the letter, is in Ephesus. The biblical text Paul quotes in his letters might indicate to us what biblical scrolls he references here perhaps Deuteronomy, perhaps Isaiah, or maybe Psalms. But we do not know whether they would be Hebrew scrolls or scrolls of their Greek translation, i.e. the Septuagint. What does seem clear is that he owns some copies of biblical Old Testament scrolls. According to Luke's Gospel, when Jesus began his ministry in the synagogue at Nazareth, he read, quote, from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Luke 4, verses 16 to 20. And the writer uses the same term, biblion, to describe this document, the term that Paul has used in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Uh, that Jesus unrolls it 
indicates that it is a scroll. What we cannot determine is whether this biblical scroll was written in Hebrew or in Greek, probably not Aramaic. The writer does not specify, and the citation in the gospel, of course, is in Greek. The presumption is that in a synagogue in Galilee, in the early first century CE, a biblical scroll used in a liturgical context would be Hebrew. However, we do know from the discoveries made in the caves uh, in the Judean desert, commonly known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, that some scrolls of the Greek translation were being used in Judea, in Palestine, uh, prior to the first century CE. Galilee was primarily bilingual, at least in Aramaic and Greek, and evidence suggests that perhaps only a small minority of the population would be literate enough in Hebrew to locate a passage in a Hebrew biblical scroll, read it, and then expound it. We do not know what percentage of first century Galileans could speak or read Hebrew or might have been literate in Greek or Aramaic. So the Isaiah text that Luke chapter 4 verses 18 to 19 cites raises some interesting questions. Was Jesus reading Hebrew that now has been rendered in a Greek form in the Gospel of Luke? Or was Jesus in fact reading from a Greek scroll? The Isaiah text that is cited here is not a perfect replication of the Septuagint text of Isaiah 61, 1 to 2a because it omits some clauses and inserts one line from Isaiah 58 and verse 6, the line that says, send away the oppressed with release, apostola tethraus menus en aphese. In other words, it is a composite citation. No biblical scroll of Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, whether Hebrew or Greek, reads precisely like this citation in Luke chapter 4. Yet for the most part, it reflects the language of the Septuagint found in Isaiah 61, 1 to 2a and Isaiah 58, verse 6. Now, if Jesus is responsible for the form of this citation, then he is not following the Hebrew or Greek text of Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, but modifies it by inserting a clause from Isaiah 51, verse 6 into his reading. In doing so, he may reflect a Jewish exegetical technique termed Gezera Shava, that link texts in uh, the uh, Hebrew scriptures whose context has the same lexemes or something of that nature. And this led exegetes to interpret one text in the light of the other. Now in the Hebrew context of these two Isaiah citations, the phrase, Razon le Yahuwah, what is pleasing or favorable to Yahweh, occurs in 58.5 and 61.2 of Isaiah. The Old Greek renders this Hebrew noun, its own, uh, with the appropriate prepositional phrase as dektos. In 58.5, it becomes nesteon dektain, an acceptable feast, and in 61.2, kiriu dekton, acceptable for the Lord. The problem is, is that Jesus does not reference Isaiah 58 verse 5 when he reads from the scroll. Rather, in the two Old Greek texts of Isaiah quoted in Luke chapter 4, the common term is aphesis, meaning releasing from usage or bondage. And so we find in Isaiah 58 verse 6, apostola tethros menus en aphese, meaning setting free of those who are in some kind of oppressive state. And also in 61 verse 1, keruksai, eichmelotois, afesin, release of those who are slaves or prisoners or something of that nature. And so in Luke 4 verse 18e and 18g, the word or the lexeme that tends to bind these two texts together is aphesis this idea of releasing or something of that nature. In other words, the intertextual connections that are being drawn here in the use of Isaiah 61.1 and Isaiah 58.6 seem to arise from the Greek form of the text, not the Hebrew text. 
In the old Greek text, aphesis, in fact, represents two different Hebrew terms in Isaiah. And so a Hebrew term does not seem to be the basis used by Jewish scribes previously to link the text based on the Hebrew text. If then the Jewish hermeneutical principle of Gezerah Shavah is operative in the combination of these two Isaiah passages in this quotation, then it seems to be based on the Greek translation, not the Hebrew text, in my opinion. Again, if Jesus is the one who links these two texts because of this Greek term, then is he doing it as he is reading the Hebrew text, or is he, as he is reading a Greek scroll? Or is he linking these texts because of some other similarities that occur in their surrounding context, i.e. reference to Sabbath or Jubilee year some uh, imagery or something like that? Regardless, in the gospel narrative, in the act of reading this scroll, Jesus is making this ad hoc intercalation of these two Isaiah texts. How exactly he accomplishes this feat in the moment is not revealed by the Lucan writer. Now, I must also say that it is quite possible that it is the Lucan writer who is in fact bringing these texts together and presenting them in this way. But regardless, you have the intercalation of these materials seemingly operative at the level of the Greek text. Now, if Jesus is responsible for the intercalation of these two texts, whether using the Hebrew or Greek text, what authority does he have to do this? What would his audience have made of these adjustments? Would they even be aware? What motivated him to do so? And conversely, if Jesus read strictly the Greek text of Isaiah 61, 1-2 without intercalating Isaiah 58, 6, then why has the writer of Luke or some other person in the early church made such change? Whether we argue that Jesus or the Lucan author is referencing Hebrew or Greek text, we still have to account for the changes observed. Now it is texts like these, in my opinion, in the New Testament that make us pause and ask, what access did Jesus or the first Christians have to biblical scrolls of the Jewish scriptures? Did they access Hebrew or Greek copies? Would any non-Jewish Christians or diaspora Jews have any Hebrew competence as they read such materials? The Christian mission occurred primarily within the Hellenistic world, and so naturally the Greek translation of the Old Testament would be the primary text form accessed by non-Jewish and probably diaspora Jewish people. But having said this, who among them could access such documents or possess the competence to read, let alone to interpret such complex texts? And if they did, where did they learn such skills and from whom? In other words, what Bible, if we can use that term anachronistically, did this first generation of Christians use? and who taught them to interpret it as they did. And then we might go on to ask the question, how does answering these questions or seeking to answer these questions help us to understand the New Testament writings and their meaning for us today? So this is then the subject of our conversation. However, we might eventually answer such questions. The fact remains that for the most part, the writers of the New Testament documents, when quoting the Old Testament materials, cite the old Greek translations of the various Jewish biblical scrolls rather than the Hebrew text, or making fresh translations into Greek of such Hebrew texts. From the data found in the New Testament documents, we think that probably Paul, perhaps the writer of Matthew's gospel, may occasionally offer their own translation of Hebrew biblical texts or employed Greek translations that were different from the so-called Septuagint or Old Greek translation. If Matthew is the tax collector and is then the author of the first gospel, he might have developed the competence to read and interpret Hebrew texts. We certainly know, according to Acts, that Paul seems to be educated in Jerusalem by leading Jewish scholars, and so he also seems to have that skill but we have little knowledge about the Hebrew language competence possessed by other early Christian leaders, such as James, Jesus' half-brother, Peter or John, or even Jesus himself. Even Jewish Christians, such as Stephen, 
Apollos, Priscilla and Aquila, were diaspora Jews. And if they were literate, this would probably have been in Greek or possibly Aramaic. Luke is non-Jewish, but an educated Greek speaker. What evidence we do have indicates that early church leaders primarily access Jewish scriptures in Greek form, and the evidence in the New Testament indicates that for the most part, this was the old Greek translation, that is, the so-called Septuagint. One of the fascinating facts that any analysis of Old Testament text cited in the New Testament reveals is that the New Testament writers or characters never debate whether the Old Greek translation that they cite is as authoritative as the Hebrew text. They assume that both textual traditions, Greek and Hebrew, express God's word, with perhaps the Old Greek providing what we might call additional understanding, but not contradicting the meaning of the Hebrew parent text. As Philo, a Hellenistic Jew and contemporary of Paul, argues the Greek translators were inspired in their work as prophets. This seems to be a fairly strong perception among some aspects of Second Temple Judaism. Not all. So while scholars today notice differences between the Hebrew text and its Septuagint translation, using these to argue a case that New Testament writers base some of their theology on mistranslated Hebrew texts, this does not seem to be the perception generally in Jesus' day, as far as we can discern. There is some evidence that some parts of the Septuagint were being revised to reflect a revised Hebrew text more closely. The evidence from the Greek Minor Prophet scroll found at Nahal Hever and dated to the mid-first century BCE. However, the motive for such revisions of Old Greek texts is not entirely clear. Now, a few facts about the Septuagint as translation for those who may be relatively new to this area of study. What do we know about the circumstances in which the Old Greek translation occurs? First, it is a Jewish enterprise that occurs initially and primarily among the Egyptian Jewish diaspora. However, it is possible that several books were translated in Palestine, perhaps Ruth and Ecclesiastes. The translation of Hebrew documents, secondly, occurred over the span of four centuries, from approximately 280 BCE to around 100 CE. The Pentateuch is the first segment translated, probably around 285 to 250, BCE in Alexandria, Egypt, followed by the Psalms and Prophets, and then perhaps followed by the historical books. We're not quite sure when Job, Proverbs, and Song of Solomon were translated, but probably in the late second, early first century BCE. Ruth and Ecclesiastes perhaps get translated later, maybe first, mid first century CE. So we're dealing with a very, uh, mixed group of materials generated from different times by different people, different locations, but now brought together to be understood as the Septuagint. Thirdly, during the history of its production, Hebrew texts of the Jewish scriptures concurrently were undergoing adjustment and development. As the diversity of Hebrew texts, such as the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Qumran text, the Proto-Masoretic text indicate. If Jewish scribes were adjusting the text of the Old Greek during this pre-Christian period to create greater alignment with emerging Hebrew texts, then which Hebrew text might they be using to do this and why? This is an area of great discussion and debate. We don't have time to elaborate on that tonight. Fourth, apart from some apparent coordination for the translation of the Pentateuch, the translation of other books seems to stem from the actions of individuals without any kind of central control of the process. This means that each book in the Old Greek, including those in the Pentateuch, have a unique fingerprint when it comes to translation technique. It may be that some of the materials that are sort of like collections, like the 12 Minor Prophets, were done by one person and considered as a kind of 
singular document, even though they have a plurality of materials. There is some evidence that later translations paid attention to how earlier translators rendered their Hebrew texts using similar vocabulary, phrases, and so forth. We should also note that some translators give more weight to representing the meaning of the Hebrew text and some to representing the form of the Hebrew text. Those texts that give more attention to accommodating Greek readers often reflect theological ideas that build upon the theological framework of the Hebrew text, but are somewhat different, being contextualized to the diaspora context. This is also the case with the translation of legal materials in Exodus, and our next presenter probably is going to talk a little bit about that at the next section. Sixthly, some texts commonly included in the Septuagint and known today as the Apocrypha are original Greek compositions. For example, Wisdom of Solomon, the second to fourth Maccabees, additions to Esther, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, and some other additions to Daniel. And yet some seem to have Hebrew or Aramaic originals as well that have not survived or only survived in very fragmentary states, such as 1 Maccabees or Tobit, Judith, Psalms of Solomon, Barak, Prayer of Manasseh, and the letter of Jeremiah. In the case of Sirach, we have most of the Hebrew text. <coughs> Excuse me. The Septuagint version, then, is the Old Testament employed today still in the Greek Orthodox churches. And finally, because of Hellenistic influence in Palestine, Jewish people commonly spoke Greek and Aramaic in that region. The discovery of Septuagint materials in Palestine dated to the first century BCE indicates the usage of the Septuagint texts in Palestine prior to and at the time of Jesus. So those are just uh, some ideas to think about when you reflect upon the Septuagint. It is complex. It is a document prepared over, it is a, a compendium of many documents prepared over many decades and by different people. And that variety has to be very uh, front and center in terms of our understanding of individual parts of the Septuagint. So we move then to think a little bit about how does the reading of the Septuagint today help us to understand and interpret the New Testament more accurately. I think that for most Canadians today, it is probably very difficult to access the Septuagint in any meaningful way. The uh, situation has changed in the last 15 years, however, because Oxford Press has published a New English translation of the Septuagint, which usually is referred to as NETS. It seeks to follow the New Revised Standard translation in its wording so that English readers can compare the translation of the Greek Old Testament in NETS with the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament in the NRSV. And in that way, get some sense of the variation and the ways in which the Old Greek translation managed the Hebrew text that they were translating. Now, tonight we want to just consider three New Testament texts uh, that cite Old Testament materials and try to understand what they tell us about the influence of the Old Greek translation upon these writers, perhaps the speakers within the text, as the case may be. Understanding the use of the Old Testament, the Greek citations by the New Testament writers and characters, might enable us then to understand <clears throat> what biblical scrolls they were using and how they interpreted them. Now, this is a complex area, so we're not going to be able to look at all of the things related to each of these three, but hopefully to get some sense of the issues that they raise. Uh, all of these are taken out of Greek Isaiah, and so the text we're going to use with Isaiah is going to be the one that uh, Ziegler produced. Now, the first text we're going to look at is Matthew 1, 22 to 23, in which there is the quotation from Isaiah 7 and verse 14, a much discussed and debated passage, 
And uh, as they say, we're not going to be able to look at all the matters that arise from it. But we'll take a look at a couple of them anyways. So in the PowerPoint, uh, what I've tried to do is to give you a sense of, on the left-hand side, the text as it emerges in the Greek New Testament with the translation in the NRSV. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the edited text of Old Greek Isaiah 714 and the translation of that in, it should be NETS, not NRSV, I'm sorry. So you can see as you compare them back and forth that the focus is upon look, the virgin, the young lady of marriageable age, however you translate Parthenos, uh, has become pregnant, engastri hexe, and she shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel. And when you look across to the old Greek side, you can see that there's a great deal of similarity. Uh, the major change that I have underlined there is that the person of the verb in the NT quotation is third person plural, they shall call. But in the old Greek translation, it is a second person singular, kalesis, you shall call. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few moments. As a general process, as you come to use of Old Testament and New Testament, I think it's always important, first of all, to get a sense of what the Old Testament context is that's being referenced. So in Isaiah 7, just very briefly, this is a time during the reign of Ahaz. He, Israel is being threatened by invasion by two northern Aramaic kingdoms. Yahweh invites Ahaz to ask for some sign that these kings would be destroyed and Israel would be preserved. Ahaz refuses, claiming it is sinful to test Yahweh. Yahweh then criticizes him and reveals a sign will be given, namely the birth of a child through, quote, a young woman of marriageable age, Alma in the Hebrew text. Before that child is old enough to discriminate right from wrong, God will destroy these two northern kings, but the threat to Israel will remain and be replaced by one that is greater, i.e. Assyria. Neither the woman or the child is identified, but many scholars consider that it refers to the birth of a son of Isaiah reported in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 3, named Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Chapter 8, verse 3 also reflects the language of chapter 7, verse 14. So there seems to be some initial fulfillment of this sign during the reign of Ahaz. Child receives another name, Emmanuel, and all this is repeated in chapter 8 and verse 8. And then in chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, another promise relates probably to a more distant event, the birth of another child, and the epithets used to describe him suggest that this child, a future king, is not merely a human figure. No pre-Christian Jewish interpretation of these texts, however, exists. So we do not know whether prior to the coming of Jesus, Jewish scholars related them to any particular messianic speculation. At least that's my understanding. So just a few observations. In my opinion, Matthew's quotation should be considered part of the divine messenger's speech to Joseph. Now, I know this is a little bit uh, idiosyncratic because when you read the Nestle Allen Greek text, edition 28, uh, they set it apart as being an editorial comment on the part of the Matthew writer. However, the expression tuta de geganen hina pleirothe, or pleirothosen, translated as, and this happens, or happened, in order that it might be fulfilled, or they might be fulfilled, occurs three times in Matthew's Gospel. Here, in verse 22, in chapter 21, verse 4, in chapter 26, verse 56, and in each case, it concludes a, discor a discourse communicated by an angel or by Jesus. The perfect verb form, gegonin, expresses the idea that something happens, extending from past initiation into the present reality, and in some sense then has currency 
although one can <clears throat> use the perfect to emphasize something that has occurred, uh, it tends to suggest something that has consequence and is resultative in some way. We might express it as is happening. If this is how the writer of the gospel wants us to understand it, it seems that it would enable us to see the material in verses 22 and 23 as part of the angel's message to Joseph. It's interesting to me that in Luke 1, 31, the parallel passage where the angelic messenger uses the same text, it is very much part of the angel's discourse to Mary. Anyways, that's just a, a little note to think about. Now, if it is, in fact, the angel's message to Joseph, that might have some implications. Secondly, and perhaps the most controversial part of this quotation, is just what is meant by the Greek term parthenos. Now, the Hebrew term alma in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, means, as I said, a young woman of marriageable age, according to the Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. The Greek term parthenos occurs frequently in the Greek Old Testament, but for other terms, such as na'ar, meaning girl, or bethula, uh, uh, virgin, and so forth, that kind of thing. Sometimes the Greek translator will use other terms to represent Alma. Parthenos only represents Alma in two texts in the Old Testament, the Greek Old Testament. In Genesis 24, verse 43, where we have the story of Rebecca and the, the search for, or the selection of her as a wife for Isaac, and then in Isaiah 7, verse 14. In both cases where this occurs and Parthenos is used, the context narrates divine initiative. In Genesis 24, 43, Ebenezer, seeking a wife for Isaac, prays and asks that Yahweh will show him which of the young women in Laban's household should become Isaac's wife. Presumably, this, this woman will be a young woman of marriageable age, but presumably someone who has had no sexual experience. In Isaiah 7.14, Yahweh, when he gives the oracle to the king Ahaz, incorporates this term, Alma, and the Old Greek translation renders it with Parthenos. Now, according to the New, Greek, New Cambridge Greek lexicon, edited by Diggle and others, the Greek term parthenos describes, quote, an unmarried woman who has reached the age of puberty. It normally reflects a social distinction between unmarried and married, and not a biological one between virgin and unvirgin. However, they then go on to list virgin as one of possible meanings. So this is a term, parthenos, that seems to have a <coughs> primary, re primary reference to a young woman who is not married, but someone perhaps who has not had sexual experience. Now, what's the significance of this? The significance is that Parthenos is not the word chosen by the Matthean author to describe Mary. It is a term that has been already used in Isaiah 7.14, and because this text has been incorporated into that discourse, the term Parthenos is then brought into relationship with Mary and her situation. So in Isaiah 7.14 then, what the, the translator is saying by using Parthenos is that a woman of marriageable age is going to conceive and bear a son and so forth. And while there may be a little bit of uncertainty as to whether or not this woman has had prior children, uh, I think the weight of the evidence would suggest not. When we come to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew is stressed in verses 18 and following that Mary is betrothed to Joseph, but has become pregnant before the marriage is fully consummated. She's with child, but she has not yet had sexual relations with Joseph. In addition, the text in verses 18 and 21 that talks about being with child, she shall bear a son and you shall call his name, uses language also found in the quotation from Isaiah 714. 
So the writer of Matthew has intentionally integrated language also found in the quotation from Isaiah 7.14 into the texture of the Matthew discourse. And by doing this, he has anticipated the quotation, but also tried to show in other ways how significant this quotation is for understanding the story about Mary, Joseph, and the birth of Jesus. Finally, coming to then this use of the third person plural, kalesusit. In verse 21, the messenger tells Joseph, you shall call his name, second person singular, using the singular verb kalesis, the same verb form used in Old Greek Isaiah 7.14. However, in the actual quotation, the text in Matthew uses the third person plural form. They shall call his name Kalesusin. Now in between these two uses of this verb in Matthew's gospel, the messenger explains why this name, why the name of the child will be Jesus, Joshua, because, quote, he will save his people from their sins, unquote. So the change in person may indicate that it is the messenger who is referencing the quotation in his discourse and he changes the person of this verb to reflect that the people of that generation affected by this individual will agree to name him Emmanuel. In other words, the plural form of the verb does not mean that the writer is offering a new translation of a Hebrew text of Isaiah 7.14, because the, Greek, the Hebrew verb is second person singular in all of the uh, Hebrew texts. And uh, in the Greek translation of 714, we have again a second person singular form of the verb. And this suggests rather that it is the writer or else the speaker in the discourse who is adjusting the quotation in light of the new divine initiative represented by Jesus. People will recognize that this child is indeed God with us. Now, we have just looked at these things very briefly, and there's much more that I'm sure needs to be said about such complex texts. But just two or three sort of outcomes to think about. First of all, the New Testament characters and writers regard the Old, Test Old Greek and Septuagint translation as a valid representation of the message first expressed in the Hebrew text. They employ the Greek translation to provide fuller understanding, perhaps, of what, in fact, Yahweh is doing in events associated with Jesus Messiah. In this case, the extraordinary nature of Jesus' birth indicates that it is Yahweh's sign that something unusual is unfolding and Israel needs to pay attention. Secondly, the New Testament characters and writers employed the language of the Old Greek translation to express their message. Uh, therefore, thereby affirming concord between the message of the Old Greek translation and the new developments witnessed to by the New Testament documents. Now, I know some will argue that in the actual historical situation of Galilee, uh, people were speaking Aramaic or speaking Hebrew or perhaps Greek. So we really don't know in the actual historical situation what a character might have been quoting what language they might have been using to quote these materials. However, in the actual written documents of the Gospels, the, the words and the mouths of these characters are in fact, by and large, the old Greek translation. The idea of virgin birth, for example, was not found by New Testament writers in this Jewish text, Isaiah 7.14, and then used to devise some story about a virgin birth. That is my opinion. The lexical discussion about the meaning of both Alma, the Hebrew term, and Parthenos, the Greek term, indicates that these terms, while they did not necessarily specify virgin, they could at times refer to a young woman of marriageable age who previously had not given birth and thus was still, in fact, a virgin. Rather, it seems that the context of Isaiah 7 through 9 led New Testament writers to discern the relationship between these signs pointing to the birth of an extraordinary Israelite leader and in some way the birth of Jesus. It might also be the case that the angelic messenger, if this is in fact a presentation of a 
of a historical event, chooses this Isaiah text because of its reference to Parthenos and its appropriate description of Mary. As well, the use of the name Emmanuel in Old Greek Isaiah 7.14 defined the significance of this first century birth and the writer and the speaker pick up on this and incorporate it into their material. So that's one text to think about. How the writer, how perhaps a speaker of that day was using and incorporating Old Testament Greek materials into the structure of a New Testament document and working with the way that Old Testament Greek translation had phrased the meaning of the Hebrew text in order to communicate something special in terms of this new character, Jesus. Now we're going to move on to look at another text, uh, quite a different one, but somewhat related, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. This text, even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. In the Isaiah text from 8, verse 12, do not call conspiracy all that this calls conspiracy, and do not fear what it fears, or be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. The Old Greek translation, never say hard, for whatever this people says is hard, but do not fear what it fears, neither be troubled. Sanctify the Lord himself, and he himself will be your fear. Now the, the text and the question here is the way in which Peter, or whoever has written 1 Peter, has inserted into the apparent quotation the term ton Christon, following Kirion in verse 15. And so the New Testament text reads, in your heart sanctify Christ, the Messiah, as Lord, as the NRSV translates it. So we're going to look at that just for a few moments. In the Hebrew text of Isaiah 8, verse 12, the oracle predicts the Assyrian destruction of Samaria, and though Israelite leaders out of fear conspire to oppose the Assyrian menace, these human efforts will be fruitless. Rather, the prophet urges Israelites to fear Yahweh and put their trust in him. He will become their sanctuary when their entire society crumbles under your Syrian onslaught. He is Emmanuel, Isaiah 8 and verse 10. The writer clearly is reflecting upon this oracle in several passages in 1 Peter. You can see 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8, where he similarly quotes material out of chapter, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. Just as in the Isaiah context, so in the view of this writer, God's people are oppressed by evil people prompted by Satan, but they should not fear such calamity because it signals rather Yahweh's blessing. They should put their confidence in God. And then he cites Isaiah 8:12 as his authority for such a theology, and he adapts the citation to his context in some remarkable ways. The first thing I, I would note here is that he contextualizes the quotation by using a plural genitive pronoun, autan, to describe their fear. And so in Isaiah 8, verse 12, <clears throat> it is, Do not fear what it fears or he fears, neither be troubled. The it presumably referring to the uh, people of Israel or this cabal of conspirators within Israel. However, in 1 Peter, you'll notice that it is a plural form. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. Uh, the reason why this might be adjusted and so forth is because perhaps the multiplicity of opponents in the perspective of the epistle writer is much greater. Fear here, with the pronoun, probably is an objective genitive. It's fear that arises from such threats. So fear that arises from their threats. Fear that arises from its 
threat, something like that. So perhaps uh, I should go back and correct myself in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12. Uh, do not fear its fear, probably is a reference to Assyria, right? So I'll correct that. In the context then, what the writer has done in 1 Peter is contextualize this, recognizing the multiplicity of those who perhaps are opposing the Christian uh, faith communities and so forth. A more profound thing that the writer does is to equate Lord, Kyrios, who in Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 12, 13, is in fact Yahweh Zivaoth, the Lord of hosts. To equate this Kyrios term with Christos, which we know in the New Testament refers to Messiah. The writer juxtaposes then the title ton Christon immediately after the title or the name Kyrion, that in the Old Greek translation here represents the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Exactly in what sense he does this? This is a double accusative structure uh, that we find in 1 Peter 3, verse 15, following the verb uh, hagiazita, to make holy, to make someone something, something of that nature. Uh, it could then be that we have an object, uh, sanctify the Messiah, ton Christon, as Lord, as one translation. Uh, if indeed ton Christon is to be viewed as the direct object, and then Kirian would be the complement, the definer of ton Christon. Or perhaps we're just dealing with a simple apposition. Sanctify Kirion, Lord, i.e. the Messiah in your hearts. If the focus is on the, trans, on, on the Old Testament citation, it is just sanctify, all right? You will sanctify the Lord himself, Kirion Autan. Autan there being a self-identifier in this sense. It's not a separate object and so forth. And so what you seem to have is a shift going on between what the Old Greek translation has presented, following the Hebrew text, sanctify Yahweh himself, and he will be your phobos. But in the first Peter text, we have this adjustment, sanctify Kirion, but instead of autan, it is ton Christon. And so should we read verse 15 of 1 Peter, like we read Isaiah chapter 8, and uh, understand that the writer is identifying Kirion with Ton Christon, you shall sanctify Kirion, who is Ton Christon, the, you know, Kyrios, who is Christos, Yahweh, who is Messiah, in your hearts. Hard to know exactly how the writer of 1 Peter intended us to understand his construction here. However we might resolve it, it is clear that in other texts in 1 Peter, uh, particularly, for example, chapter 2, verse 3, where he cites Psalm 34, verse 9, referring to Jesus as Lord, or again in chapter 3 and verse 12, where he seems to apply Psalm 34, verses 16 to 17 to Jesus, and in the Old Testament psalm, that's material applied to Yahweh and so forth, it suggests that at least the writer is showing some kind of close fundamental identity and association between Kyrios and the Christos. What all of the significance of that might be is, again, open to debate. Uh, Paul and others in the New Testament do similar things with this kind of terminology. So again, some ideas emerging out of this very short discussion about this text. Uh, first of all, that uh, in this text, we find the first generation of believers declaring that Jesus is Lord. They did not merely assert that he had power or was their master. They used the term that defined Yahweh in the Greek Old Testament uh, 
to define Jesus in some sense, and by so doing showed the relationship between Jesus and Yahweh. Of course, this was the ultimate scandal that generated the schism within, between Christianity and Judaism. Secondly, the writer of 1 Peter, in this context, uses no introductory formula to inform his audience that in 1 Peter 3, 14 to 15, he is in fact quoting from Isaiah 8, verses 12 to 13. And this is also the case with his previous citation in Psalm 34, 13 to 17. Presumably, the one who is publicly reading this letter <clears throat> could make these connections clear and explain their significance, if some in the audience were not aware of the writer's intentions. Or perhaps such passages as Isaiah 8 were being read and taught in the earliest church communities. As noted earlier, the writer refers to this passage also in chapter 2 and verse 7 and 8. And this citation might prepare them for the one that occurs in chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15. It might suggest that the early Christian communities were studying such Old Testament texts in order to understand the significance of Jesus and their personal confession of faith. The Jewish scriptural texts were in fact the only Bible that they possessed at this point and they accessed it through its Greek translation. Now time is going here, so I'm going to uh, omit the section on Romans 9, 32 to 33, because I don't think we have time to deal with it. And if we could move forward then to slide 17, and we'll just draw some conclusions. This brief review of these three examples of, or two examples of how New Testament writers use materials from the Old Greek translation indicates various ways in which the Septuagint influenced early Christian thought. First, they did read it as scripture and perceived no difference in my view in authority between the Hebrew text and its respective Greek translation. They could quote it as God's word without hesitation and where it differed in meaning from the Hebrew text, it offered additional insight into the meaning of God's word as revealed. And so they could employ the language and syntax of this translation to reinforce the message of the gospel and use it to explain the significance of Jesus. Of course, when we look at that usage, it raises some significant questions for us. Secondly, it enriched their Christology, but did not form their essential Christology. In other words, when they used the title Kyrios, for example, to characterize Jesus, the Septuagint's use of the same term to translate the proper name Yahweh reinforced something about Jesus' identity and his relationship with Yahweh. Thirdly, the Old Greek text of the First Covenant made it easier to demonstrate its continuity with the Second Covenant implemented by Jesus. Fulfillment terminology expresses this reality most clearly the characterization of Israel could be applied then similarly to the renewed people of God generated through faith in the Messiah. Terminology such as ecclesia used to describe the covenant community of Israel could also be applied legitimately to the new covenant community the Messiah initiates. So then finally some possible implications of the Septuagint reality for our <clears throat> understanding of evangelical Christianity today. First of all, negative attitudes towards the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures generally emerged after the separation between Judaism and Christianity that occurs towards the end of the first century CE. Because the Christian community, primarily Greek speaking, used the Septuagint as their Bible, Jewish leadership became critical of it, arguing that it did not truly represent the meaning of the Hebrew text. However, in the first half of the first century CE, as far as we can tell, Jewish communities seemed to value both the Hebrew text and its Greek translation and regarded them both as valid expressions of Yahweh's word. We don't find any debates in print about whether Hebrew or Greek texts are better or not within the New Testament documents. Now, the activity that happens in first century BCE, where you get revision of Old Greek translated text uh, 
to bring them apparently into closer alignment with Hebrew texts is perhaps some indication of unease with some of the ways that the old Greek translation handled that Hebrew material. But in the New Testament documents themselves, we don't find any debate about such matters. That's the point. Secondly, Jewish, Jesus' personal use of Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic texts of the Jewish scriptures remains unclear. However, in the gospel narratives where Jesus cites Old Testament materials, the writers tend to use Septuagint texts. Some exceptions might occur, but these are infrequent. Since they are writing Greek documents for Greek-speaking audiences, the use of Greek Old Testament texts would be normal. However, they do not make their own translations, it seems, of Hebrew texts, but they employ the Septuagint translation by and large. In numerous cases, they incorporate into their narratives terminology that occurs in these quotations, integrating them into their compositions in some very deep ways. Thirdly, the Septuagint functions as a bridge for the use of key terms found in the Hebrew text and their Greek equivalents captured for the Christian message. We know we've looked at Emmanuel, for example, or Parthenos, uh, that kind of terminology. But other terms such as diatheke, covenant, hagios, holy, pistis, faith, elpis, hope, agape, love, communicate key theological ideas. And these are embedded in the warp and woof of the New Testament documents. Fourthly, being aware of Septuagint texts and terms used in the New Testament has particular relevance for matters of Christology, the nature and identity of God's people, the relationship between Israel and the church, and the nature and function of divine revelation as it presents the meta-narrative that expresses God's eternal purposes. And finally, the use of the Old Greek translation as an authoritative expression of Yahweh's revelation to Israel set the precedent for Christians to accept translations of the Greek New Testament also as authoritative representations of God's word. And this became a significant factor in advancing world missions. Thank you. I'll look forward to your discussions and questions uh, as we have time. All right, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, we will now take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you can do so either through uh, speaking over Zoom or uh, by using the chat box if you prefer. Joel, did you have a question for Larry? Yeah, last one. What do you think about the idea that the, the, the use of the Greek Old Testament was more of a practical move mm -hmm. in that it wasn't a concern if there were necessarily differences between the Greek and the Hebrew uh, because of the necessity and the impetus of the movement, this Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. and so. Do you think that's a possibility as well? And what do you think of that idea? Yeah, sure. In my view, the <clears throat> use of the Old Greek translation probably had various levels of uh, motivation. I think there is a practical consideration in that the audience is by and large are Greek speaking. And so in order to communicate in any meaningful way, uh, in, in a, how should I say, an un- uninvolved manner, i.e. having to read the Hebrew and then give a translation to Greek and so forth. Uh, it was just a natural way for them to talk about these Jewish scriptures as they had need to. It was just, as you say, a practical thing. But it seems to me that the way that the writers particularly incorporate the terminology even the syntactical structures that occur in the Old Testament citations into the surrounding discourse suggests that this is not just, they're not using the Old Greek translation just as a kind of practical way of referring to Old Testament texts, but are actually thinking deeply about it. And 
saying the actual language of this text is important because in some way it gives voice to what we believe and what we understand the uh, significance of the Jesus event to be. I think there's also a third element or layer, if I could put it this way, and that is that I think because Christianity emerges out of a Jewish context and the, is the essential first leaders were Jewish Christians and so forth, that I think many of them being Hellenistic Jews had already been accessing the old Greek translation as their Bible because they couldn't access directly the Hebrew text. And so for them, it's not so much a practical thing, it's just their scriptural tradition. If I could draw an analogy for Christians today, sure, we have to, in Canada, because we speak English and so forth, we have to access it through English translation. And that's a very practical thing, but it doesn't take long for that to move from bring just a practical necessity to this being my Bible and the words and the language of the English translation becoming significant for the expression of their faith and that kind of thing. So I think there are layers to this. So I wouldn't dismiss the practical, but I think it goes beyond that very quickly in terms of just the dynamics of the mission and the way in which the early Christian community developed. So, yeah. Yep. All right, Larry, we have a question from uh, John Linneberger, mm -hmm. and uh, he's asking, uh, to what extent should evangelicals in North America today treat the Septuagint as authoritative? Mm -hmm. Does it have independent authority or only dependent authority? Or more to the point, should it be used by preachers when they prepare sermons? And if so, how? Right. Well, you've embedded three or four key questions into one. So let me try to unpack a couple of them, right? Uh, <clears throat> I think with any translation, you have dependent authority. And I think that's just the nature of translation. Uh, the revealed word of God, as we understand it within the Old Testament context, is in Hebrew. However, the reality is, is that very in the two or three centuries prior to Jesus, that Hebrew tradition became transformed into, translated into a Greek format. And for many Jewish people, that was how they accessed their scripture. For example, Philo, as far as we know, he couldn't read Hebrew. And yet he writes reams of commentary upon the Septuagint text of uh, the Pentateuch and regards it as transparently authoritative. Now he has arguments for that. He, he regards it as prophetically inspired and so forth. And so he goes the way of saying they're equally inspired and thus they are how shall I say, on the same level when it comes to inspired authority. But I think for the church today, if I could put it that way, I think we go back to the fact that the Hebrew scripture of the Old Testament is our uh, revealed word of God. And the old Greek translation by and large should be regarded as dependent and authority. Now, when we come to the New Testament, <clears throat> because that material is incorporated into the New Testament, that's a complexity. Because as that material gets incorporated into the New Testament and gets used, etc., the way in which that Old Greek translation expresses the meaning of the Hebrew text somehow gets intertwined with the way the writer of that New Testament document is presenting his or her message, his message primarily. And I think in that way, then some of that material has to be regarded as, if you want to put it, authoritative, because it's how that New Testament writer, if you believe in uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in guiding that person and so forth, has led that individual to incorporate these materials in that way into that written document. So I think that creates a bit of a complexity. The sort of third issue then is how do we handle this today? 
I think, again, today we have to regard the Old Greek translation as dependent, authoritatively. But because the language that it uses and the grammatical structures and so forth have influenced the shape of the New Testament, it provides insight into what the New Testament writers were trying to communicate. And so for preachers today, I think it is important for them to have some awareness of how the language transformations are happening as you move out of the Hebrew base text and the way the Hebrew language and semantics work into the Greek form, which has then been brought into uh, the New Testament discourse. And so you take a term like uh, <clears throat> diatheke, all right, covenant. Berit in the Hebrew text uh, has a certain meaning, and there is certain semantic overlap between berit and diatheke, but diatheke is not the normal word that one would use in Greek to describe a covenant between allies or uh, dependent people and so forth. Uh, syntheke would be a more suitable term. Diatheke tends to be more reflective about a will or a testament or something of that nature. But for some reason, the Greek translators chose diatheke, and that becomes the term that is then used in the Greek New Testament. You can't ignore that, in my opinion, as a reality when it comes to interpreting the New Testament and understanding what, in fact, that term means. And I think Paul then references that ambiguity in Galatians chapter 3 when he talks about the idea of the old covenant being a testament, it's being a will, and you can't add a codicil to it, and so on and so forth. He's taking advantage of that ambiguity in some sense in order to make a point about the relationship between the old diatheke and the new diatheke, and so forth. So I think preachers today have to be somewhat aware because you can't jump immediately, in my opinion, from Hebrew text into citations from the Old Testament that are used in the New Testament or the way the language, the, le the lexemes work from Hebrew to Greek and so forth. It's a more complex phenomenon that has to be carefully, I think, and uh, <clears throat> somewhat pre precisely considered. So, okay. Another, we, thank you for that, Larry. We have another question who came in that came in from DJ, and uh, DJ is asking: um, You discussed Luke four eighteen as a composite quotation of related Isaiah passages. Mm -hmm. I know it's a more tentative area. But are there any examples of composite allusions you'd consider compelling and clear or otherwise popularly recognizable by biblical scholars today? Now, um, I don't know, GJ, are you making a precise distinction between quotation and allusion? Good question. Uh, there certainly are many composite quotations in the New Testament. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I hear yeah, I think DJ was going to talk. Okay, go. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, like an example might be, I don't actually understand when the quotation is clear from the original um, language or not, so that's kind of something I'm a little bit mm -hmm. ignorant about, but um, like maybe the words of uh, God and Jesus at the baptism might be considered a composite illusion, even though it's not. Okay. Uh, explicitly saying, yeah, mm. you know, as it is written here. Yeah. You know, yes. I. Okay. Sure. I understand what you're trying to suggest. So, uh, a text like Mark chapter one, then, and uh, <clears throat> verse eleven, a uh, voice came from heaven, "You are my beloved son. In in you I have taken pleasure." And uh, of course, there's great discussion as to whether the language there uh, reflects a text like. 2 Samuel 7, or uh, the Genesis account of the I I Isaac sacrifice, and so forth, and things of that nature. <clears throat> um, 
I think that there are contexts in which New Testament writers and speakers borrow the language from the Greek Old Testament in order to formulate their own expressions. And it's not quotation, but it's using what I would call religious language with which they're familiar in order to <clears throat> communicate ideas with a kind of register of meaning that goes beyond just the surface level of the terms. And so by using that language that was previously expressed in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and so forth, they're creating echoes, as Hayes suggests, and so forth. And uh, yet they're not formally quoting, and they're not formally trying to make, how shall I say, straightforward allusions. It's just, this is the language that you use when you talk about these kinds of things in the framework of Christian ideas. Uh, some of it may be more deliberate and intentional. I think in other contexts, it's a little less so. Uh, I have wondered, for example, in a text like Mark chapter 4, uh, where you've got Jesus apparently referencing Isaiah chapter 6 in his <clears throat> discussion about the use of parables, Mark chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, there's no formal uh, formulae of introduction to indicate it's a quotation. The language doesn't quite match what you find in Isaiah chapter 6 and so forth. And yet there are obvious similarities between the formulation that Jesus uses and what you have in Isaiah 6. But there's sufficient difference to raise questions in my mind. Is Jesus here actually quoting? Uh, is he alluding? Is he just taking the language generally out of Isaiah 6 and reformulating it to express his own ideas? What's really going on here? So I think in the New Testament, you have sort of formal quotations. And then I think you have allusions that are deliberate references back into that material for a variety of reasons. And perhaps some of those allusions are quite formalized, if I could put it that way, quite intentional. But perhaps some of the other allusions might not be just might not be as intentional. It's just the way Christians speak, as it were, about these things in the normal course of events. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, in the text that we looked at there in verse 15, <clears throat> which doesn't have an introductory formula, I think there's probably enough literary similarity between, uh, linguistic similarity between uh, what Peter says, uh, what the Petrine text says, and what you have in, uh, I think it's Isaiah 8 verse 14 there, to suggest that this is a quote, even though it's not identified as such, and, and Peter is just writing along, as it were, and, and he's using that text because he's talking about fear, and fear is a great theme within, uh, within his letter, and he's trying to address that issue and how to help these Christians respond to the threats that they're experiencing and to deal with the fear that that generates. And so you've got text being war uh, woven into the scope of his discourse, but he doesn't take pains, as it were, to formally identify it as such, because I think he's more interested in communicating the ideas. Uh, and perhaps in the context, people then who are reading that letter <clears throat> officially in the faith community would take the time to unpack it more. But the initial focus of what Peter is trying to say there is, uh, don't be afraid, all right? You don't have to fear uh, this opposition uh, because, you know, the Lord is on your side and so forth. So it's a long answer, I'm sorry. Uh, but I think to your initial question, I think there are composite allusions. Uh, and some of those might be quite intentional, as you indicate in Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 12, and so forth. Right. Uh, we have another question from John, and uh, it is... Uh, a compound question, I think, and some of them are quite complicated where I think he's going. Uh, 
but he's asking, uh, how should the pluses and minuses between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint be handled? First question. Next question. Is the Septuagint considered to have dependent authority only when it has a Masoretic text counterpart and to have no authority at all when it does not have a Masoretic text counterpart? Follow-up question. Or could some, at least, of the additions to the Septuagint actually be considered as authoritative as the Masoretic text? And if so, where are the limits? Because in some books, the Septuagint has a lot of additions to the text. Oh my, those are great questions, right? One could have a whole seminar, a week seminar on all of those things. Um, and I would invite maybe send me an email and we can chat more about that and so forth off, offline and, and things of that nature. Let me just deal with one small piece of that very complex question. Uh, I'm working on Greek Exodus. And of course, in Greek Exodus, uh, once you get to chapters 35 to 40, uh, you get an immense amount of textual dislocation and differentiation. Uh, in the first 34 chapters, by and large, uh, the translation tends to follow the Masoretic text quite uh, in a quite straightforward manner, word for word. Uh, 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 let me rephrase that, in a quite straightforward manner, following the word order of the Hebrew text and often reflecting the syntactical constructions. But nonetheless, the writer shows great freedom and creativity in expressing the sense of that Hebrew text. He's not bound to the form of that Hebrew. And so from time to time, that means that he adds words uh, for clarification. And in other contexts, he omits words because he doesn't feel that they are necessary or in some ways redundant or uh, not, not contributing to, uh, in the Greek context, uh, the sense of the passage. And sometimes this will relate to things like pronominal suffixes. Sometimes this will relate to the tense of Greek verbs. Sometimes it will relate to uh, presence or absence of the article. Uh, and in other cases, it will relate to uh, the way in which uh, compound expressions in uh, the Hebrew text are handled within the Greek text and so forth. I think by and large, though, the Greek translator is at pains to try to communicate as faithfully as possible the sense of that Hebrew text but in a way that is contextually understandable and appropriate to his audience in the third century BCE. And so he's writing this tight, he's walking this tightrope between faithfulness to the Hebrew text, but on the other hand, <clears throat> the compulsion, the importance that he feels to communicate the significance of that Hebrew text in a way that will be understandable to his Greek audience and applicable for them. Uh, I think, again, Dr. Kritko in the next session will give you some examples of what that looks like. So I think on the, the general perspective, the pluses and the minuses that you find in the normal course of the translation uh, often are occurring at least in the more sophisticated translations like Exodus and Genesis, because of that desire on the part of the translator to communicate the meaning of the text. There are places, of course, where the parent text that the Greek writer is using is different from the MT, and uh, that's a different issue. And there are also places, of course, where the writer, for whatever, the translator, for whatever reason, uh, offers a very different interpretation, and sometimes we just don't know why. Uh, in Jonah, for example, <clears throat> in chapter 3, where it talks about the, uh, in the Hebrew text, uh, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Uh, in the Greek text, of course, it's just three days. So how do you get from 40 to 3? There's no way the Hebrew text can be read that way, and so forth. There's no alternative Hebrew text that the 
as far as we know, that the translator would have had access to. It seems that the translator is making an adjustment based upon his reading of the narrative, that if the original prophecy said 40 days, then by the time Jonah gets to Nineveh, there's only three days left. There seems to be a narratological rationale that's provided. So there are various reasons. When you got to the big chunks and so forth, and I guess you're thinking about the additions to Esther, additions to Daniel, uh, some of the Daniel materials or things of that nature, I think those are of a very different order. And in my opinion, uh, we need to treat those more within, evangel within Protestant Christianity as we have treated the Apocrypha generally. That's just my opinion. But it is a complex question. So. Wow. Yeah, I was, I was quite intimidated by John's question, actually, when <laughs> I saw that in the chat box here. Uh, we have another one from uh, Daryl. And uh, Daryl's asking, what exegetical significance do you see has been missing by New Testament scholars in general from a lack of expertise in dealing with Septuagint quotations? And uh, what resources are available to address those shortcomings for students whose interests lie primarily with New Testament studies rather than the Septuagint as a corpus of its own? Uh, okay, a couple of uh, suggestions in terms of sort of deficiencies, if you want to put it that way. I think uh, one of them is that New Testament scholars perhaps don't take time enough to understand the fingerprint of the individual translator. And they tend to look at Septuagint as a big mass, homogenous, and so forth. I think if New Testament scholars are going to deal credibly with specific citations. They have to take the time to understand the way the translator of that old Greek text has in fact operated. And if they don't, then I think they're, they're going to be prone to make misjudgments in terms of those particular elements. So that's one area. You really have to look at each document in the Septuagint on its own to understand how it's working and then have a basis for evaluating the, the reason for the citations for it. I think a second element is that um, we often forget that these uh, books translated were done over such a long period of time. And uh, <clears throat> I think we have to understand that as Second Temple Judaism developed, and as these translations began to emerge at different times in that development, that the historical context does, I think, affect the nature of the translation. And so the Pentateuch that's done in the first 50 years, apparently, of the third century BC under a Ptolemaic regime in Egypt has a flavor that reflects that. I think Greek Isaiah, texts like that may be more reflective of the Maccabean and Hasmonean period. And as Ari van de Kooy has tried to articulate at some, in some situations, there's more of a focus on the contemporization of some of those prophecies into that context. Uh, not everyone agrees with that. Uh, Troxel, for example, doesn't quite support that perspective. But I think the point is, is that as you move along in that historical tradition of Second Temple Judaism, the nature of the translations also reflect those changing times and those changing politics and those changing religious values and so forth. And so again, the homogeneity of the Septuagint cannot be taken for granted. And I think the third thing I would suggest in terms of New Testament writers, uh, scholars, is uh, the lexical stock that you find in the Old Greek translation has to be treated very carefully. Uh, we still, I think, struggle with the idea of a kind of Jewish Greek or kind of religious Greek. And uh, I think that's not the case that we have in the Septuagint. We have Koine Greek, as John Lee has been at pains to point out although used in service of a Jewish religious situation. 
But that's not to say that this is suddenly, uh, that, that there is a kind of Jewish religious dialect out of that, that has been the source for this material. And so I, I think that, while that's largely laid to rest, we still find the traces of that in the documentation and resources uh, that many people frequently use in terms of trying to interpret these terms and expressions and so forth. So those would be three uh, elements that I would suggest New Testament scholars need to be aware of and cautious then as they appropriate these Old Testament materials. Now, was there another part to that question? I, I sense there was. Uh, yes, resources. Uh, I think probably a good place to start is the commentary by Beale and Carson on the use of the Old Testament and the New Testament and their introductory essay, I think gives you a good set of procedures and uh, methodological guidelines to help you in that process. And then you get examples, of course, of how to work those out uh, through the various uh, writers' commentaries on the New Testament documents. Thank you, Larry. Right. Um, you know, Larry, just to give an idea of uh, what kind of work has to go into uh, Septuagint research. Uh, I'm going to ask a question about your commentary. Uh, how long have you been working on your commentary? And uh, when do you think it will be complete? And, and you know, because I'm particularly interested in the depth you have to go into right. for translation yeah. technique and so on. Well, uh, I've been working on it for probably 12 years and uh, <clears throat> now into chapter 36. So just ending, hopefully, so another four chapters. Uh, Dr. Kuritko is collaborating with me. He's looking at chapters 21 to 24. And so our goal generally is to try to have a completed manuscript by the end of 20, 2023, perhaps early part, first half of 2024, all right? Uh, and then of course, there's all the editing and all the other stuff that will have to go into that. So Lord willing, maybe end of 2024, but uh, that may be optimistic, so. I'll, I'll give one more little yeah. insight into this. Yeah. Larry and I often go back and forth mm -hmm. on things, and what we've both kind of concluded is that, is that to properly do the research on a simple verse, a simple mm -hmm. verse, nothing with no mm -hmm. deep dive questions, it's about one work day yeah. for one verse. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of effort it takes mm -hmm. to do to do yeah. Septuagint commentary on tra translation technique. Right. It's just it's painstaking. You you have to yeah. look at it from a lot of different angles. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there are other commentaries that have been written that we're trying to interact with well, and uh, try on that basis then to reflect not just our own perspectives but the perspective of other scholars, like in the uh, the. The Bib d'Alexandrie, for example, the Brill Commentary, and other monographs that are, have been written on specific parts of Greek Exodus and so forth. So, uh, Weaver's material, of course, is uh, fundamental to all of that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating mm -hmm. and uh, it's quite intimidating sometimes yes. how much work it can take up. Uh, Dirk Buchner has. Uh, shared stories about how he was researching cows yes, one day sure. to uh, yeah. interpret Leviticus. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he spent a whole day yes. uh, reading about people's complaints about having their cow stolen and the right. various vocabulary oh, yes. uh, pertaining to the taxation of cows mm -hmm. in the Ptolemaic mm -hmm. Egypt and right. so on. It's quite, it's quite out there. <laughs> I've actually had that exact same research hole that I've been in, cows in Ptolemaic Egypt, and it's actually a joke in my household because I'd say to my wife, I'm looking up cows in Egypt again, and just I spent a long time looking at that. <laughs> yeah. That's well, funny, I should talk with Dirk. I didn't know that he'd done that. Yeah, in, uh, in the later part of Exodus, of course, you've got the 12 gemstones that are part of the uh, high priest's ephod and breast covering and so forth, okay? And you have two separate lists. Fortunately, they're pretty well the same, but just the trying to figure out, did the Greek translator truly understand what the Hebrew terms were referring to as gemstones and did he match them appropriately and so forth and that kind of stuff. It's really hard because the Hebrew terms often are very um, uncertain in terms of their meaning. And then you're trying to say, well, 
maybe the Greek term is uncertain, it's in meaning, and so you've got two uncertainties, and you're trying to say, okay, what do we really make of this because of those two uncertainties? And uh, that, that can be really tough, so you do your best. I wonder if that helps to answer John's question too, maybe. which mm -hmm. just that sometimes we don't actually have a good grasp on the Hebrew meaning, mm -hmm. and the Septuagint might be our best yep. resource, mm -hmm. and in that way, it almost gains an authority That's because true. it it is closer mm -hmm. to the to the time of right of the Hebrew composition. Mm -hmm. It's people who are more adept at the Hebrew language mm -hmm. or Ar and Aramaic. So perhaps it, it gives us a, a light into things that we can't see anyways. Sure. When we, and especially mm -hmm. when we pre presuppose a Hebrew being more important yes. than is, but but we don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. So how is that helpful, right? right. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps that's, a, that's what right. you were saying there is is right. help to, to John's question. Right. Thank you. Very tough question that he asked. Yeah. yeah, so it's an authority mm -hmm. without being enshrined as mm -hmm. canonical authority. Right. It gets it anyway, yes. uh, so. even yeah. though we don't think it deserves it. Right. So. It's a shadow cast, perhaps, you know, in a certain sense, from the Hebrew text onto the Greek. And if the Greek is the only way you can access, then it has to be your authority, right, in a certain sense, in that yeah. way. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, um, well, this is our last call for questions for Dr. Perkins. Uh, uh, I've got one if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead, David. Thanks. Um, you, you said at one point um, that the, in, in your conclusion that the Septuagint enriched their Christology but did not form their essential Christology uh, for, for, for the um, New Testament writers. Yeah. Obviously, you mentioned in, in 1 Peter how we have that identification of of Christos with, with Yahweh or, or so on. Um, could you talk more about th this en enriching of Christology? Would there be any other quick go-to examples or could you just flesh that out a little bit more? Sure, yeah. What, I, what I'm trying to say is that sometimes uh, in New Testament scholarship, you read that um, <clears throat> the Christology evolved, right? And you had sort of certain ideas that were initiated and then somehow as the early church developed, uh, they were overladen with fresh and new understandings and so forth, okay? And uh, sometimes the Septuagint is brought in as a kind of aid to demonstrate that. And in my opinion, um, I think the way that the New Testament writers worked was they had their essential Christological understanding formed very early, probably in the first 20, 25 years of the early church. And then as they were engaged in the mission and were called upon to explain in greater detail how all of these ideas really should be understood, they fell back onto the resources of the Septuagint to provide some understanding of these things. That, that's how I think about that process. Um, in terms of examples, uh, other than the Kyrios example, uh, one might be this idea of son of man uh, that you find in the Gospels. And I know within the Nicaean context, it's often viewed as a reference to the, the humanity of Jesus. But I think when you look at it in the context of the Daniel Septuagint materials uh, and the references within that vision that Daniel has in chapter 7, the Son of Man is a heavenly figure. And the, it's anthropomorphic in form because of the contrast with the four beasts that previously appeared. And this now is in the form of a human and thus qualitatively superior. I think that's sort of the idea. But the actual figure then is viewed not as a human figure, but as a divine figure, because that figure sits with Yahweh on his throne and to him is given the kingdoms and so forth. So when Jesus then appropriates that terminology, uh, which in Daniel is a figure like a son of man, it's an arthrus, it doesn't have the article, but Jesus always uses it with the article, the Son of Man. And I, I think that that's probably a kind of anaphoric use of that article, referencing back to Daniel, because he actually quotes material 
out of Daniel 7 on several occasions. And so the, you have then the incorporation of that into the terminology of Jesus and the understanding of that as he now being that figure that sits with Yahweh on the throne and is in charge of the kingdom that Yahweh is establishing and so forth. And I think you get the collocation of that terminology and those ideas in chapter, uh, is it chapter 14 of Mark in the trial scene uh, <clears throat> where Jesus says to the high priest, yes, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and sitting at, you know, all of that coming together in that situation. And so I think you see the use of that sort of Septuagint language by Jesus himself, and then perhaps subsequently by others in Revelation and so forth, to argue for uh, <clears throat> not so much the humanity of Jesus in that term, but rather his deity and the glory that he has because he is the fulfillment of that vision that Daniel sees. So that might be one other example of that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you, Larry. Uh, this concludes uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, I would like to give a reminder that our next presentation in this series will be here at 7 p.m. on November 9. Our presenter next time will be Dr. Joel Karitko. Uh, Dr. Joel Karitko is a specialist in Koine Greek, the role of law in ancient society, and is a research fellow at the Weavers Institute for Septuagint Studies. Joel completed his master's degree here at Axe Seminaries and his PhD in Oriental Studies? Uh, they've changed the department name, but yes. Okay. Oriental Studies, uh, perhaps now something else, under Dr. Allison Salveson at Oxford University. The title of Joel's presentation will be, When Does Translating Change the mean Meaning of Scripture? In his presentation, Joel will explore Jesus' treatment of the Law of Moses in his teachings. Uh, it looks like it will be a fascinating topic, so we encourage you all to come out again, uh, spread the word among your friends and colleagues, and uh, please do not miss this exciting event. You can enroll for Joel's presentation through the Northwest's website. Again, it will be here at Northwest Seminary and College and Acts at 7 p.m. on November 9. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Perkins. You're welcome. All right, blessings to all. Thank you. And have a good night, everyone.